This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. It is said you need money to make money. For many, especially those born into riches, this is true. But this wasn't the case for Narendra Raval, who rose from humble beginnings, worked hard and built a multi-million industrial empire. Known as the guru, Narendra is one of Kenya's most successful entrepreneurs. The steel tycoon founded and transformed the Devki Group, East Africa's largest building material company. While well, his passion towards business landed him among the top 50 richest men by Forbes Africa 2015 list. But beyond owning a multi-million dollar company, Narendra is one of Kenya's most devoted philanthropists. This week, from the headquarters of Guru's Steel Empire, we bring you the inspiring story of Narendra Raval. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Before we begin our interview, let's take a look at Narendra Raval's journey to success and how Devki became what it is today. Born into a family of farmers in India, Narendra Raval is a self-made man. His humble beginnings did not stand in the way of his incredible success. Raval moved to Kenya at the age of 16 and after a few years of working as a priest, he opened a small rolling mill business, a factory or machine for rolling steel or other metal into sheets. His startup grew and expanded until it became what's known today as the Devki Group of Companies, a conglomerate with steel and cement manufacturing facilities in Kenya, Uganda, Congo, and Ethiopia. With an annual turnover of $650 million, Raval is one of Kenya's top 10 taxpayers. I'm putting up a steel plant, which is the first steel plant after South Africa in all Africa, which will make Kenya import free of steel, which we'll be making from the iron ore. I want to make sure that I can give back to the country and also to the government. We want to make sure that we create the job. We industrialize the country. Uh, so one of the, f if I am as an industrialist, if I don't do, who will do it? Devki currently employs more than 4,000 people, many of whom started out with no experience but have benefited from training and in some cases a higher education funded by Raval. Uh, I didn't have the experience when I joined, but now when I started working with him, I've learned so much, I've gained so much experience. Then again, when it comes to issue of the personal now issue, he has been like a father to me. The Afki group of companies has changed many lives in the town of Oriro. Since I joined this company in the year 2005, we have seen a tremendous change, a lot of improvement, a lot of support in terms of the welfare of workers and to the environment, to the community within the Oriro and uh, Thika, uh, Kiambu County and the whole of the country, Kenya. Priest, business magnate, philanthropist, and now author. The 57-year-old father of three has recently published an autobiography. He hopes long walk to success will inspire other entrepreneurs to follow in his footsteps. Guru Raval, thank you very much for your time. I want to start from the very beginning, from your childhood, because you were born and raised in Mathak, in Gujarat, and in your autobiography, you talk about the tough times you had while growing up. You talk about the struggle, the helplessness uh, that you had. Uh, tell us about your early childhood and how you overcame that. See, I was born in a family of a farmer, and my grandfather was a teacher in the school. So we were not that fortunate uh, in the village because that time there was no electricity, there is no road, uh, there is no vehicle. Uh, the, the, the biggest luxury which I, I have seen at that time was a bicycle of somebody, not my own bicycle. So that was the luxury we have seen. And uh, it was, uh, it was a, it's a tough time, but that tough time now I realize. At that time it was the best time for me because I never knew other side of the life. 
But you also talk about how you did not complain, and uh, even as you talk about it now, you didn't know you were poor, you did not complain uh, despite the helplessness. Tell us about the journey and your family and how you ended up in Kenya. I, uh, why I, can't com I, I don't complain is because until you have not experienced something, you will not miss it. I'm born in a priest caste. India has got four castes. One of them is a priest caste, Brahmin. I'm born in a Brahmin caste, and uh, we are supposed to be actually preaching in the temples. But uh, maybe God had uh, different plans for me. So I started my journey from Mathak. I studied there up to Standard 5. After that, we were looking for a better place to, to study further. But we didn't have, my parents didn't have the, the means to send me anywhere else. But one of our district's name was uh, Surendranagar, which is nearest city where uh, one temple with boarding offered uh, 12 rupees for a year and to study, stay there, eating everything, which was cheapest we can get. So I went and studied there. It was uh, also very difficult. Uh, that there, there was a big problem of food because we used to get, uh, maximum we used to get food twice in a day. But sometimes once because uh, maybe you made some mistake or you didn't uh, recite the slok correctly. So that was the problem. No student stayed there more than six months. I stayed there for two years because my door were closed behind me and I knew if I go back uh, I will be, I don't have any other choice. So when you don't have a choice uh, I think you, st you, you don't uh, regret, you, you stay there. And then you arrived in Kenya uh, as, as a priest assistant. How was that for you? How was, I mean you went to Kisumu. I went to Kisumu, yes. In the western part of Kenya. Yeah. See, after uh, there, I, I studied. Then I was, uh, after two years, I went to another city called Bhuj. There also I was in the temple. I was serving the, the God. And then one of the, the saint said that you are a Brahmin and we need a priest in Kenya. And we want to send you Kenya. Do you think you will uh, leave your study? And uh, are you ready to go? And it was... Uh, God talking to me. I, I jumped, I said, what, is the, what I will do and what I will get? Then they told me that you will get approximately 700 uh, shillings salary, which is almost, uh, it was $20 at that time in a month. But that $20 for me was a uh, heaven, you know. I said that that is uh, extremely, uh, it's not my even capacity to earn that. So I accepted and they sent me to Nairobi. And uh, when I landed at uh, Nairobi airport, of course, I was uh, 16 years old. I was crying because I left my, 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 my childhood, my, my parents, my, my everything, all life of, uh, of India. So I was feeling inside that this is a different country. Whether I will be able to, to enjoy or I will be able to settle here or not, whether I will get food or not, because I never experienced that I get uh, food on time or food... Uh, uh, what I, I like because you are a 16 years boy who wants many things, except, expect many things, but right. was not available. I went to the temple and the first day and the second day I had to start preaching and I started preaching almost uh, 500, 600 uh, the people every day in the evening. And that's how I, I practice how to become uh, uh, a successful priest. So how did you get into the trade and manufacturing business? After three years, I went back to India and then I went to Kisumu. I was sent to Kisumu. Uh, I, I was not sent, but after three years when I went back to India and when I came back, uh, I came back because of I didn't have anything to do in, in India because I loved the country so much, Kenya, that uh, the very humble people, very nice. In three years, I learned fluent Swahili. And I used to communicate in their time with them. So I was missing Kenya when I went to India. And within two months, I came back. I went forever from Kenya, but I could not settle myself in India. And uh, I just took the ticket, although the priest post was fulfilled by the somebody else. So I had to go somewhere. So I went to Kisumu. And I looked for where to stay. I stayed with my auntie for a month. Then I came to Nakuru. And uh, slowly, slowly, I came to, to, to Nairobi, worked with a hardware shop, hardware, uh, sorry, steel mill, Kikuyu steel rolling mill. 
and uh, they also said they went to overseas what happened to their family their old brothers went to then i started the hardware shop in gikomba you started the hardware shop in gikomba, in gikomba. and here you are today yeah. with a company that forbes has estimated is worth about 400 million dollars i think yes they must have seen my account somewhere but i don't have i haven't seen it but they of course they did uh, mention the uh, on uh, they featured me on the front page uh, some time ago uh, and uh, we do employ 4500 kenyans at the moment we have a uh, steel and cement company we are the largest steel and cement manufacturer at the moment in east africa and uh, we have uh, uh, plans which is in next three years time we are going to employ directly 10,000 kenyans uh, by 2021 by expanding our cement and steel business which we are expanding in uh, uganda in uh, Nakuru already it's under construction and Mombasa. So what would you say though to, to young people who are in a similar position because yours has been a story of struggle, of hard work, uh, of resilience over 30 years. What would you say to young people who are in the similar situation as you starting out and they can't see a way out? They can't see a way out. I, I, I do see. That's why I, I wrote the, my autobiography to, to, to help the young entrepreneur young graduates of the Africa and world, that uh, even if you are not educated, less fortunate for education sometimes, even if you don't have the finance, you can do it. I didn't have finance. I didn't have food for the, uh, the second time in a day. In the evening, what I will eat, I didn't know. I used to eat in the different people's home uh, because it wasn't available. You can do it, but you have to be a uh, focus. You got to be your company should be correct. That should not be the company who is going to take you for the partying and, uh, and making you maybe habitual for the wrong habits like drugs and, uh, and spending the monies. You keep yourself always on path. You must believe in God. That's what I say. You must believe in uh, uh, God means what? God means actually it's not that you believe in this God or that God, but believe in somebody whom you will be always fearful so you don't commit any sin. And be faithful to yourself and to the others and make sure that you are a risk taker. If you are an entrepreneur and if you are not a risk taker, you can't. Less borrowing is the biggest thing. If you borrow when you are just growing, you will, you will die because your business can be good, cannot be good tomorrow. And if you have borrowed the, the money to given, uh, you will give it to the bank. This is continue 24 hours, the meter is running for the interest. So try not to borrow in the beginning. Try with the smallest sh shop or a, or a kiosk. No problem. Then you make millions of kiosks. Because now technology, when I started, there was no technology. Now there is a technology available. I can run the business from here to Ethiopia. We are running. We are in Ethiopia. We are in Congo. We are everywhere. I don't go there. You make people powerful. With me, I, you must have heard that if you want to walk fast, you walk alone. But if you want to walk far, walk with the people. And I want to walk far, and I want to walk with everybody. And I want to make sure that the people benefit from this book, which is written, uh, it's a long walk to success, and it is a long walk to success, but we got the success, and everybody can get it. So tell me about your book. You've written an autobiography about your life. Tell me about your book. This, uh, I tried to, to write this autobiography. Uh, it's just to make sure that uh, people know how I made it. And I want the other people to read this book because one thing is that uh, I didn't have the money to buy the book. I used to borrow the books from the colleagues. And today my book has become bestseller in the world. It has been described as the most inspiring book and of 2018. 2018 by the Bloomsbury in the world. So this book will tell our entrepreneurs, our children, how you will be able to achieve and how you will be able to, to be successful in your life. I would I request everybody to, to, to buy this book wherever they can get it. It's available online also. I want my dream is to translate this in the Mandarin language, Chinese language, and also distribute it there so that the children read this. Because it is available in English, in Indian language, and this Chinese language I want to do it. This will change people's life. So India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has a lot of praise for you and he's actually said that you have done a commendable job in bringing Kenya and India together. How did you manage to do that and how did you do that exactly? See, India and Kenya is, uh, of course, all the countries have got the political ties. 
and the narendra modi is a very good friend of mine we we have i know him since uh, since he started the career in politics and uh, i was also he didn't have anything i didn't have anything so i think we shared we shared cup of tea together on the platform uh, on the on the footpath but what i can say is that uh, when he was coming to kenya uh, before that we kenya and india had a, a couple of issues which was not uh, uh, sorting out it was difficult for resolving in a political way uh, which i try to to intervene and we resolve that and now kenya and india is doing a, a very good business very good uh, uh, you know, the friendship both the country has and uh, bilateral uh, whatever the agreement is now going to be implemented and they are implementing it we try to see that how kenya comes closer to india so that everybody benefits in kenya especially all right and i did it and i'm very proud that i have done it very inspiring conversation. Let's take a short break now, but when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Guru Raval. Stay with us. China Global Television Network. From broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective six channels and a video content service news when you want it and where you want it on TV screens websites mobile platforms and social media CGTN see the difference welcome back to talk Africa today we are in conversation with Narendra Raval also known as guru and you have some interesting philosophies around um, your children and around money as well because in your book you talk about telling your children uh, to think twice before they spend a single penny on themselves uh, but to spend they can spend a million dollars helping others that is no problem why that philosophy though see I believe that we all are managers uh, I have come here with the uh, two pairs of, uh, of the dhoti we call it but let's say two pairs of trouser and the shirt and until that one is, is secured, I'm in profit. So that means rest all belongs, rest all belongs to, the, to the people. It's not mine. I'm just managing it in my best way forward. And I, will, I give this to my children also, that manage yourself such a way. Don't, the person who spends on himself more cannot spend on the others. This is what my belief, maybe I'm wrong. If I spend something on me, I feel guilty because I want to spend for for one of my worker's child. I want to spend it for one of my worker's family, uh, any medical. I want to spend it for their education. I want to spend them to buy and better clothes and I want to see the smile on their face. Then I feel very happy and that is what I think is the real happiness uh, we have. Because I have seen the day, uh, one day we were going in, in India, there was some food and we were going to sit somewhere and the shopkeeper told us, you get away from here, you will spoil our uh, balcony which is outside the shop he says you go so the, with the paper we had food uh, me and my father then we went somewhere in a corner and we have eaten and I, I, I don't mind I didn't get the insulted but I still can't forget that that when you don't have anything people will ask you who are you but when you are somebody or when you have something people will ask you how are you that's very interesting. But you have also said you will keep 50% of, of, your, uh, of your wealth to yourself and yes. your family, but that you're going to give away uh, the other 50 to the, the society. What is the philosophy behind that? And in those charitable um, organizations, which one is very close to your heart? Uh, the, uh, in especially in Africa, I have the very close to my heart is first is food. We feed 3,000 children last 20 years. Not today. When I didn't have food, I started giving food to the others. We, th we feed hot meal every day to 3,000 children. Uh, that is the food is the first thing because 40% of Kenyan sleeps without second meal. I feel, always I feel guilty that. <coughs> so the first is food, the second is education and the medical. I see that you get very emotional when you talk about giving to society. Why is that? Uh, because uh, it was, it's difficult for anybody to give. I've seen people don't know how to give. 
People don't want to give. They think that it is mine. But it is not theirs. You will go. Yours is a very inspiring story, Guru Raval. Do you believe that this story, a story such as yours, from rags to riches, can be replicated? It is, yeah, because it's not difficult. I am not a graduate person. I never seen the, the, the university. I never went to university. Although my, my book is now sold in Harvard uh, uh, Business School, uh, what you call this, Harvard uh, Library, uh, which is a great achievement for, for me. But, but definitely it can be uh, replicated if somebody decides to do it, if somebody really wants to do it from heart. Because I have decided to, to be somebody when I was before 16, when I was 14, 15 years old, that I want to make money because if you don't have money, nobody wants to know you. This is what I realized. And I made sure that I have never lost the focus. It's not my cleverness, but I never lost the focus. I always worked towards that, and I never left the truth. I want to make money, but I want to make money on the path of truth, that I have to be always honest. Honesty pays, and this is what I've learned. And I will loudly tell to everybody, be honest to everywhere, including your family, customers, suppliers, bankers. You will be successful. Africa is a young continent. It has a lot of young people. 60% of Africa's population is made up of the youth. Today we talk about a lot of youth unemployment. We talk about youth feeling, you know, hopeless. Advice for the youth because you came to Kenya as a 16-year-old boy and here you are today, a multimillionaire. What advice would you give to young people? Uh, young people, and especially in Africa, I'll only say that they, they should always be careful in when they have no money, they should be always careful in the spending. Second thing, they should not be careful in spending the money only, but also time. I never wasted a single moment. When I'm supposed to sleep at 9 o'clock sharp, I used to go to sleep. When I go to bed, 9.15, I'm fast asleep. So you time yourself for all your life, because time is money also. And also make sure that you, uh, you have a good company, correct company, who does not take you to the wrong directions. If you want to be successful uh, a husband, or successful student or entrepreneur, you've got to have a right people in your life around surrounding you. If you're a wrong person or wrong people, negative people also can not let you to progress. You must take a risk in your business, in your career, but calculative risk, you'll be successful. Do you still believe though that there are opportunities in Kenya, in Africa, the same opportunities that were afforded to you in the 70s? Definitely, because when I started, there was uh, only two, two rolling mills in Kenya. And today there is 19 rolling mills in Kenya. And there is uh, all our small rolling mills, but we still need another maybe hundreds of rolling mills because Kenya is expanding, all Africa is expanding. All Africa is supposed to be built. All Africa, you go to China, you will see eight bridges in Shanghai if you go. In fact, I got, you got lost that which, which uh, bridge you are on. You are, below you is there is a five bridges, below up, on top of you, there is three bridges, vehicles are moving. If you compare that to Kenya, we have seen one or two bridges here and we, we think, oh, we have done something. We have to go very far. And there is a lot of opportunity for infrastructures and, of course, housing. Over 45 percent people don't have the, the housing in Kenya. It is apply In other countries, like even Uganda, is more than 60 percent people don't have the, they have the mud housing. So they all have to build the, 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 the steel, uh, the cement houses. So this is one of the biggest opportunity Africa has to first give the roof above the head and person will be always successful. And you also mentioned earlier that you, you are doing 90% of your business uh, with Chinese companies. Tell us about that. When I started, I started business with India in the beginning. Slowly, slowly, one day I went to China a few years ago and uh, just to see the technology. And that was just opened my eyes. Today, 90% uh, of my old machineries we buy from China. And I will tell you, all world, whether it is from Europe or from anywhere else, their manufacturing unit is in China. Whenever the, the good thing of Chinese machinery, what I have experienced, I have uh, not, uh, it's sometimes is a barrier is language, but I have put somebody who can speak both the language and uh, handle it in such a way. But I have seen some of the factories are as big as Ruiru. 
uh, for the m manufacturing of the machine. It's a reliable machine. I get, uh, you know, after service is extremely good. If we have any problem in running of the plant, next day they are here. And that service you will not get from any, anywhere else. And I'm listening to you, Guru, and I'm realizing you have a very busy life. You're a father, you're a husband, uh, and you're running this huge conglomerate. How do you do it? How do you balance your life? So to run the, the, all the industries, is, uh, it, it was very difficult for me some time ago, but time teaches, you know. The, the time is the biggest teacher I have found in my life. Uh, when I was running a shop, I was controlling everything. When I have made, uh, gone to the industry, then I, it taught me how to manage it on the managers. First, I, I have tested the right, I try to employ the right people, right manager whom I test 10 times, and then we set, and then we leave it on them. We made people powerful. They are decision maker today. I don't sign any checks. I don't go on sales trip. I don't go on the production or anything. I just do only the expansions and uh, uh, the projects. That's it. That is what is my job. The rest is all done by the people, and that's our Kenyan people. If I show you one of my lady called Margaret working with me 25 years when she was a little girl and she's not graduate but she's handling uh, all group finance. If you are not being given goods tomorrow, she's the one. She's handling my finance and we cultivated, we created her from zero to now she's a hero. We cannot live without her. So you started out from Gikomba to where you are today. So where do you see the future of your company? A future of my company, which I see, I'm putting up a steel plant, which is the first steel plant after South Africa in all Africa, which will make Kenya import free of steel, which will be making from the iron ore. I want to make sure that I can give back to the country and also to the government to run it better. And I want to make sure in such a way that we, how it is possible to support the governors. The president has got the agenda, our uh, president Uhuru Kenyatta, that we want to make sure that we create the job we industrialize the country. Uh, so one of the, f if I am as an industrialist, if I don't do, who will do it? So I want, uh, we, are, we have taken this task, it's almost $500 million project. First phase is $226 million, which we are, we already started now. Should be able to finish in 2020 end or 21 beginning. That will make Kenya import free and Kenya will save half a billion dollars every year in foreign exchange. And we will be employing there about 3,000 uh, Kenyans in Mombasa, in Nakuru will be employing about 1,000, so approximately 10,000 we want to employ by 2021, and this is what is my uh, near future. But the, in the long term, I will be definitely not going public very soon. We don't want to go public because when you go public, you lose the interest. And if you lose the interest, your shareholder loses the money. Many companies I've seen, I don't want to mention, People, our Kenyans have invested by buying the, uh, the, the shares and the company's gone down and they're gone, finished. And that's hard earned money of the people. And I will never commit that crime or a sin uh, that I take the money from the public and then I am not able to give them the better return forever. So I want to see when my company is able to give better return than what they get and it is secured forever, then I'll go public. Guru Raval, thank you very much. It's been a very inspiring talk with you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all we have time for on Talk Africa this week. But you can continue this conversation with us by following us on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall. It's goodbye.